Morning, everyone. It is time for us. It is time for us to get started this morning. Uh, as always, we, we need to keep in mind that each and every one's on our prayer list. We have some more that I will announce when we do our regular services. I'm not going to go through these extra names right now, but we need a one in particular. I think we ought to. I'm going to mention is Chester Perry. Uh, they had him at the hospital uh, first part of the week. Uh, I think it was colitis, and uh, they didn't keep him. They sent him home with medicine, so uh, uh, you know he's having a hardship with that. So we we need to keep Chester in our prayers because you know he's been a big part of this con con congregation for many, many, many years, and and the leader of this congregation for a lot of years. So. We, we always, always need to remember him. All, all the others too, but him, I just put him, put him up especially. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll go on with, with our lesson this morning. <clears throat> Please get to your songbook and turn to number 95. <clears throat> Earth holds no treasure but perish with using, however precious they be. Yet there's a country to which I am going, heaven holds all hope to me. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter
feel a little bit like Job this morning. When he said he longed for the days before he had all this climbing on him. I, I longed for some of them days so I could jump up and run up here without any problem. I can't do it now. I told Brother Maurice last week when I finished the class, he said, well, are you through with Job? And I said, yes. But then I run into Mark. He said, can you cover for me one more week? And I said, okay. So then there were some things that, in the book of Job that I didn't mention or cover, maybe a casual mention, but I thought this morning we'd just look at them in a little, a little further, a little deeper. So if you get your book, your Bibles, and open up to Job chapter 37. Be a lot of reading this morning. <clears throat> I can't remember how all these verses anymore, so I just have to read them. Actually, in chapter 38, they're going to start. <clears throat> you know, we looked at Job and all he's been through. God allowed Satan to attack him, so to speak, to try to make him curse God. But Job was a lot stronger man than Satan thought he was. He thought he could take everything he had, all his possessions, and he would curse God to his face. <clears throat> that didn't work. So then he decided, he told God, he said, skin for skin will a man turn on you. And God said, well, if you have at him, just don't take his life. <clears throat> so we know that Job was afflicted with the boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And I read off all the uh, symptoms of what he's going through with that, that uh, condition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then his three friends showed up. They weren't any help at all. They, they told him, you've done something wrong, you sinned. That's the reason all this is happening. Well, he wasn't uh, convinced of that either. So what they did for him, from chapter 3 on up to chapter 39 was back and forth. Was back, uh, chapter 38. You did this. Job, no, I didn't. I know I'm not. Yes, you did. You did this. And the other said this. Back and forth. Back and forth. And they started talking about stuff they didn't know anything about. <coughs> so that goes on and on and on. And we get to chapter 38. And you have to read along with me. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? I mean, you know, you're talking, you don't know what you're talking about. Somebody think they, they know more than they do. In verse 3, he said, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. He said, all right. It's time to, you know, we, we see that, uh, Phrase a lot, gird up your loins. <clears throat> the little tunics were things that they wore. They would reach and get that thing and, and pull it up between the legs and pull it up tight to not hinder their whatever they were doing. You know, they'd be free of moving. No. That's what you all right, just cinch up here and let's go. That's what we would say. Nothing to obstruct you. Here you got work to do. <clears throat> Then God begins with a series of questions. Now, I think there's about 68 or 70 questions that he throws at Job. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you imagine sitting in a class with a teacher that knows the book from front to back? He knows everything. Well, I had a history teacher that way. His name was Harry Richard. He was a member of the church and attended East Side for years to passed away, but he was a great teacher in Bible history, American history, world history. I'm sure he knew it. But can you imagine him calling you up and says, come here, Ernest, sit here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you these questions and you answer me. <laughs> I was a history student anyway. But that's what fixed out to Job. God is calling him to attention. Look here, stand up. Answer me this. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it if you have understanding. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? 
who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? <coughs> he said, Young boy, you when I created the earth. And you tell me what it did. Who, who drew the line? Who put up the batting board? Who did the chalk line? Who did the data line to lay out the area? Tell me, Joe. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, where were you? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made a cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, he swatted in the bag for it, swatted in the band, and break up it for my decreed place and set bars and doors. In other words, he asked him, who put the bounds to the sea to water? Who, who binded it up? Who kept it just flowing out? When he talks about as if it had issued from the womb and part of childbirth, you know, when the water breaks, the water flows out. And he said, that's what the ocean would do, but how come it didn't? How, who stopped it, Joe? Who bordered up the ocean? <coughs> In verse 11, he said, And hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud way be stayed. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know its place? Do you control the morning and evening? Do you tell the Day, dawn when they come, and darkness when they come. Verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of, of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? We're going to look at the, the springs of the sea here a little further in a minute, but there's several scientific facts that, that are mentioned here in Job that man didn't know about at this time. Science didn't discover them, well, they were discovered until years and years and years and years later. But God's asking Job these questions now. Shows you how far advanced God is that he could ask these questions that man can't answer. He said, Have the gates of death been opened unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Do you know what death is, Job? Have you been there? Have you come back? Job can't answer that. Only one person has seen death, been there, and come back. Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare it, thou knowest it. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And it's for darkness. Where is the place that they're on? Where does the light stay? Do you have a home? Where does it Where's the darkness? Where does it stay? You know, we have light and we have dark. We don't ever consider but where it goes. You know, where's the light during the nighttime? Where's the dark during the daytime? Things that we don't probably don't even think about. But he's asking Job, you know, you know so much, Job, tell me these things. Verse 24, by what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon on the earth? Who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or way for lightning and thunder? Because it's rain on the earth where no man is, or in the wilderness where no man is, where there is no man. Talks about the parting of the light, and we're going to say a little more about this in a minute, that light can be divided. You know, I think it's Isaac Newton. You know, had the prism, that the light shone through it. He saw the seven colors. God put that up right years ago with the rainbow. We got the colors of the rainbow. <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> "Who causes it to rain on the earth where no man is, or in the wilderness where there is no man? You know, it rains everywhere. God does." choose for it to rain here and not rain here. I know the deserts are dry. That, that's just the way it is. 
God says he causes it to rain where there is people and where there's not people. He said, and that's to, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground and cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Hath the rain a father, or hath begotten the, dew, the drops of dew? Out of the womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven. Who hath gendered it? The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades, or loose the bonds of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominions thereof on in the earth? Notice the ordinance of heaven. Can, Job, can you do that? Can you put all these, these planets, these stars, can you uh, or, arrange them and organize them where they in their orbits? How about it, Job? Can you do that? Canst thou lift up thy horse to the clouds that the abundance of waters may cover thee? Can you send lightning that, that may go and say unto thee, Here we are? Who hath put wisdom in the inner parts? Who hath, put, who hath given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can stay the bottoms of heaven? When the dust groweth into harvest and the clouds cleave fast together. Will thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young pup? He talked about this weather situation, not the water, the rain. Can, can you make it rain, Job? Can you call the lightning down? When the ground is dry and it's all clogged up, can you, can you call the water? Can you make it rain to dissolve these? He said, then will you hunt the, the prey for the lions that you feed the young, young cubs? When they crouch in their dens and abide in the, co in the covert to lie in wait. Can you, can you go out and feed them? <laughs> I wouldn't want to go try to feed a lion. They hunt their own prey. Who provides for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for a lack of meat. He just asked Job a lot of stuff here. That I, it's hard for me to find some of these things. Now all I've got to go on is what other people have, that have studied this deeper than I have and made notes on it and kind of looked at it and try to get an idea of what they're talking about. Some of it's plain, some of it's not. But the fact is, Job didn't know any of it. He just thought he did. God gave him the opportunity to answer it, and he did it. Chapter 39 said, Nor thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth, or cast thou thy mark when the hinds do calf? Do you know, Job, when the, these goats are going to have their young? What day, when, what hour? Do you know that? Can't thou number the month, the months that they fulfill, or more thou the time when they bring forth? They bow themselves, they bring forth their young, they cast out their sorrows. The young ones are in good likeness, likely. They grow up with corn. They go forth and return not unto them. So when, it, when it, these animals, he's talking about the goats and the hinds, the deer, have their young, they drop their young, they discard the placenta, the, the afterbirth, so to speak. The young, they begin to eat, they go, and they grow, and they go off on their own, they never come back. You know that, Joe? How do you know that? Who sent out the wild ass free? Who set, sent out the wild ass free? Or if loose the bands of the wild ass? You know, we use the modern day term donkey, but that's, they're hard animals to control. A donkey does, does pretty much what he wants to. And that's what he's talking about here. He said, do you know that the young donkeys, that they, they're wild and they're free? Who, who, who put them that way? They were made that way. He said, who, talking about the donkey, he said, who ha, whose half, house have I Whose house I have made the wilderness and barren land his dwelling. He scorneth the multitude of the city, neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. The range of the mountains in his pasture, 
is his pastor, and he searches after every green thing. So he said, you know, how'd this come to be, Joe? Doctor, he's just out there. He does pretty much what he wants to. He lives where he wants to. He don't care for the crowds. He don't like the city fire and all like that. He's, he's wild. He's out in the field. And he says, he doesn't regard the crying of the driver. You know, we've heard all these, heard these stories all these, our lives about being stubborn as a mule or like a donkey. We've always seen the picture of the donkey sitting down on, and the guy pulling and trying to get him to go. He ain't paying no attention to him. Donkey does what he wants to. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Now don't ask him what a unicorn is. There's as many <laughs> opinions on that as there are. <clears throat> he used to say Carter's little little field. There's a bunch of them. <clears throat> Can't stop buying the unicorn with his band in the fur? Or will he hire the valleys after thee? Evidently, it was some kind of animal they used to <clears throat> work the field with. To keep buying him and make him work in the fur, or will he just go try out through there and try out the bats? <clears throat> Can't control it. Will thou trust in him because his strength is great, or will thou leave not over to him? Let him do it. He's strong as they do what he, what he wants to, what he can. <clears throat> Gave his style the goodly things into the peacocks. Or wings or feathers and, and to the options. Did you do that, Joe? Did you put all that great color and beauty on a peacock when he spans out those feathers? Or did you put the feathers on the ostrich? You know he can't fly, it's got feathers. <clears throat> and the ostrich, you know, she lays her eggs in the earth and warms them in the dust. And forgetteth that they put that crust them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. <clears throat> you know, if, we, if you know anything about ostriches at all, the hen lays the eggs, the rest of it's up to daddy. He incubates them, he protects them, and after they're hatched, they follow him around until he's big, big enough to go on their own. <clears throat> That's right. Verse 16 says, She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. You know, we looked in the, in the animal field today, we see, <clears throat> and I've got a, a lesson, I can't remember the name of it, but I can deal with this a little bit. Yeah, you're not left alone. A lot of animals, when they give birth to the young, they look after them, they take care of them for a while. Others, when it hatches or when it's born, it's on its own. It has no parental guidance, so to speak, at all. <clears throat> Snakes, for instance. They don't have a school though, right? Their mom don't teach them anything. They're hatched or they're born and they're off on their own. <clears throat> it says, in verse 17, talking about the, the mother officer says, God has deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifted up herself on high, she scorned the horse and his rider. She just uh, cared for the raising of the kids. And she's pretty much on her own out there and don't like anybody coming around. <clears throat> Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid of a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He's talking about a horse, and, I, and you know, a horse is a magnificent animal. And it's wise enough, it has <clears throat> the smarts enough to know if you're comfortable around him or not. He can sense that. If you're not, you're in trouble. You're going to be a dear thing with that horse. And he can't block him either. He knows better. He said, Job, have you given the horse his strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can I make him afraid of a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. You know, a grasshopper flying around in the field, landing at a horse's foot, he'll jump. 
like the elephant and the mouse, you know what they say. An elephant's afraid of a mouse, but maybe because he can't see it. He knows it's there, he sees it go all the way, he didn't see it. He don't know where it went, so he's kind of skittish. Talk about the horse pawing in the valley, rejoicing in his strength. You know, we've seen the stallions, how they'll wear up and how they'll paw at the earth, you know, and set their domain, take care of their herd. And said, He's not afraid. He goeth on to meet armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not afraid. Did he turneth his back upon the sword? The quiver rattleth against him and the glittering spear and his shield. He swallowed the ground with fierceness and rage, neither to believe the he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He sat among the trumpeters, ha ha, he smelled the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. That horse riding in the battle, he does, he's not afraid, he doesn't consider anything that can happen to him. He's been trained to take that ride, that soldier, cavalry, whatever, in the battle, and he'll ride into the thick of it and never turn back. Joe, did you make him that way? Do you understand that? Verse 26, Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up, on, mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on a rock, upon the crag of the rock, in the strong place. How do you know these things, Joe? Or do you know? Why wow. hawk fly a certain way? Why wow. eagle build a nest this way? If you try to get Joe to understand, all these things God put there. This is God's doing, not man's doing. Talking about the hawk in verse 29, it says, For thence she seeketh to pray, and her eyes behold afar off. You know, we, we know that today that a hawk has the keenest vision of any animal. It can spot a field mouse on the ground a mile away. That's why you see them on the road, but hit by cars for once. <laughs> They see that mouse out in that field and they lock in on it and they, they get in that sword down through there, right across the road. They see that car because it's focused on that mouse or rabbit or whatever they're looking at. <clears throat> and he said, her young ones also suck up blood and where the slain, where, where the slain are, there is she. You know, we think of eagles being majestic animals, you know, and this, that, and other, but they, they are carrying ears. They feast upon the dead animals. We think that's just relegated to the buzzard. <laughs> we don't think very highly of buzzards, but they have a purpose. Boy, I'd hate to think what kind of land we'd be in without them, with all the creatures that die out here on the side of the road and out in the woods. They clean up the, the, uh, the carcasses, keeps down the odor, and keeps down disease. People don't ever realize that. God put them here. <clears throat> First four, uh, chapter 40, God said to Job, says, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Is he that reproveth God? Let him answer it. Now, Job, you've been trying to tell me what to do and what I should have done, this, that, and other. And you're trying to instruct me. If you're going to do it, answer me all this. I'm just asking. You've been trying to show how smart you are. Then Job answered the Lord and said, and he showed that, that he is smart. <laughs> really. He says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. <laughs> Not one of them, I'll just shut up. The Lord made his point. Job. With all these friends, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Some things were true, some things were stretching. But the, his friends, all they could think of was, Joe, you've done something wrong. That's the way God deals with you. When you sin, he's going to punish you. But that's not what Joe believed, and that's not what he said. <clears throat> How some of these things we notice over here in these two chapters. Notes on science in the book of Job. Many people think that the Bible and science are at odds with each other. That's not so. The God of the Bible is the creator of the universe and, 
And anytime he, his inspired word speaks on scientific matters, it speaks accurately. <clears throat> the scientific accuracy of the Bible is one of the most powerful evidences for God and the divine inspiration of the book, the Bible. You know, the harder science works to try to disprove the Bible, the more it proves it. They have, archaeology has made more discoveries in the past 20, 30 years that prove things mentioned in the Bible really were, that people have denied all these years. But now they're finding all this stuff, yeah, they come from this certain language. They find it with these writings on it that mention so and so and so and so. If they, if they want to stay where they are and not prove the Bible exists, plain from do is to quit digging. Because <laughs> the more they dig, the more they're going to find, the more it's going to substantiate what the Bible has said. <clears throat> so we have every right to expect that in the Bible, as the expired revelation of heaven, be scientifically accurate. Even though it's not designed to be a technically scientific treatise on anything. Moreover, it is entirely possible that the scriptures whenever they happen to touch upon a matter that relates to some phase of a material or physical universe, have been anticipated scientific facts that man, by means of his intellectual curiosity, would not discover for many centuries. That's like some of the things we mentioned here a while ago. God knew at the end, mentioned to Job, Job knew it, but we didn't know about it until centuries later. Wayne Jackson said in his book, The Job, page 123, after all God's revelation of truth, after all, God's revelation of truth is not limited by man's development of knowledge. God doesn't get not smart enough to prove the Bible. The Bible proves itself. We just got to understand it. And the more people dig and dig and dig, the more this comes to be the fact. Here are some of the scientific anticipations that uh, is listed in uh, Wayne Jackson's book. In Job 38, 4 through 6, the Lord asked Job several questions about the earth. He mentioned the foundations being laid. Foundations, verse 4. The Hebrew term is yasad, which is, a, in a literal sense, referring to the foundation of a house. And the foundations are, I was talking about, we see this later on in the Bible, talking about the construction of the tabernacle. He said, whereupon the foundations are fastened. Here, foundations is the term Eden to secure, meaning a socket used, the sockets in which the pegs were inserted in order to secure the planks of the tabernacle. Now, I don't know if you think about tabernacle or not, but through the research, that's what we come up with, what these words mean. But he just asked him, Job, you know, where is the foundation? Who set it up, you know? One scripture says he hangs the earth on nothing. Then they want to get into the scientific about how thick the, the crust of the rock is on the face of the earth and how deep it goes. And I don't think that that's really relevant to what Job was being told here. He wasn't getting a, a science lesson on the crust of the, the earth is 300 uh, miles deep or 300 feet deep and it goes into the rock which is so many hundred feet deep and the core of the earth. I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a building or making something. Especially a building because he's talking about the foundation. Where were you when the foundation was laid? Who laid it? Who drew the line? The Lord asked Job <clears throat> in 38.16 said, Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Are there submarine springs that issue from the ocean floor? Indeed, the earliest secular reference to, to such was recorded by the Roman geographer Strabo in 63 BC. He lived 63 BC, 21 AD. Yet the Lord quizzed Job regarding this fact thousands of years earlier. Been there all the time, nobody knew it. Job was asked, have you walked in the recesses of the deep? 38 and verse 16. In a similar passage, Dave, David referred to the channels of the sea, 2 Samuel 22, 16. The science oceanography dates from about 1873 
in the year that the Challenger expedition, 1873 to 76, commenced the first scientific exploration of the ocean floor. During this study, a canyon five and a half miles deep was discovered in the Pacific. Since that time, numerous other canyons have been found. <clears throat> One near the Philippines is over seven miles deep. And before the invention of echo sounding equipment, it was generally thought that the bottoms of the ocean would present the appearance of plains, plateaus, and gentle rolling terrain. Now we know that it is it has valley and mountain ranges, even canyons to equal all the forms that we find on land. Yeah. Have you walked on the ocean floor, Job? Have you seen the recesses of the deep? God hears them. Same as Job. <clears throat> Concerning the light and darkness, the Lord asked Job, where is the way to the dwelling of light? As for darkness, where is the place thereof? Light is said to dwell in a way. In the Hebrew word there, direct, which is literally a travel path or road. Whereas darkness is said to be a place. Light is the way, darkness is the place. It wasn't until the 17th century that it was believed that light was transmitted instantaneously. Then Sir Isaac Newton suggested that the light was composed of small particles which traveled in a straight line. <coughs> Talking about the theory of light. We know that light traveled how far? How fast? 189,000 miles per second, or something like that. <clears throat> Faster than we blink an eye. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can't get cleared up this morning. We can get some idea of the speed of light knowing that the sun is 93 million miles away. Look how quick day break appears. The light travels pretty fast, come that far, of course, to light up the day of the morning. I like sit on the deck sometimes and watch the sun come up behind the ridge over there. And you can just about put your finger up there and see that sun moving. Sometimes it's just there, sometimes it it's not, but I sit in my recliner some morning and the sun comes up through the back door, through the, right in my face. I don't move because I know it's going not going to do but a minute or two, and it'll be on up. Move pretty fast. Job, <clears throat> Jehovah also in, inquired Job, by what way is the light parted? This is where we know that Sir Isaac Newton used the prism to bend the light to see the, to part the colors from the light. But God already knew that. You know, we we saw that belong before Isaac Newton. You know, the Bible talks about God put the rainbow in the sky, the seven colors in the sky. When he talked about the certain constellations that Job was asked, Can thou bind the cluster of Pleiades and I'll loose the bands of Orion? I am not an astrologer by any means. Pleiades and Orion appear at certain seasons of the year. Hence, the Lord may have been asking Job if he had the power to alter the seasonal changes. There is, though, another possible meaning. The Pleiades is a cluster of stars, seven to the naked eye, but photographs reveal that, more than two, that there's more than 200. They're bound together in a group and together move through space. Perhaps the question was, can you loosen? Perhaps did Job do, or binding, did Job do the binding? <clears throat> Or what of Orion? Orion is a very outstanding constellation of stars that appear as a group to the naked eye, but they are actually vast differences apart, distances apart, and are in fact unassociated. Hence, they're loosed. Would God ask him, Job, did you, did you do that? Did you part them to have a part like that? Or did you bind Pleiades? I don't know how much uh, knowledge Job had of astrology either, but he's asking pretty deep questions here. Things that we didn't, man didn't know about on the first or years, years later. <clears throat> we know that the dominion of our nearest star, the sun, 
and ordained of God to rule the day, Genesis 1.16. Without it, of course, we would not survive for one minute. Then there is the moon, which Moses declared was appointed to rule the night. You know, the moon is our closest neighbor. The moon revolves around the earth in an elliptical orbit. It takes the moon 27 and one third days to orbit the earth. And you know, when it's on the light side, the gravitational pull is going to get the low tide. I mean, high tide. We'll get high tide on one side of the earth, it's low tide on the other. Because it's pulling the water up pulling it down from the other side. And it rolls around it. And it does that uh, three times a day, two times a day. It's got two high tides and two low tides. If the moon were significantly larger or smaller, life on Earth would be altered drastically. But some of these things I mentioned, does it appear that uh, somebody knew what she's doing? when everything was created and set into motion. It didn't happen by sort uh, by chance. It didn't come from any big explosion. And I, to this day, I can't figure out why people want to hold this Big Bang Theory. This is where everything come from. I was a kid who used to play the firecrackers a lot. And I'd yet put that firecracker under a pile of wood or rocks or something like that to set it off and it go bang and then here I've got a pretty rock structure sometime like a, a, a uh, fireplace or one stick of wood blow it up and here's a little wooden car come out of that. That's the illustration I've heard you take all the little screws and wheels and things you can find and put them in a bag, shake them up and pour it out. And get a Rolex watch. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But that's what people say today. Big explosions out there in space, and here we got all this universe just floating around here, just in perfect order. Well, I hope it's been some advantage to you this morning. I know it's uh, that's some deep stuff, as old saying goes out there, but I wanted to run over that a little bit and give you an idea that Joe. You start to know what he's talking about. And sometimes we do we're the same way. We need to study more. Thank you.